Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'a Media presents The End of Riba by Sheikh Bilal Dannoun Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in All praise is due to Allah And may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and upon all those who follow his guidance, who follow his way until the last day. My dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Know my dear brothers and sisters that a Muslim is one who submits, surrenders, and obeys Allah Azza wa Jal. Al-Istislam. When you and I say that we are Muslims, that means we are ready to submit our will to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Part of this submission is to avoid the limits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set. Allah in his book or through his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has set limits. And we should not come near these limits and we should not transgress these limits Allah Azza wa Jal says Tilka hududullah fala taqrabuha they are the limits of Allah do not even come near them elsewhere Allah Azza wa Jal says Tilka hududullah fala ta'tadooha they are the limits of Allah do not transgress them so we submit whether or not our limited intellects understand the wisdom behind these limits or not. Because we acknowledge that Allah Azza wa Jal is Al-Hakim. That He is the All-Wise. That Allah Azza wa Jal does not legislate a thing except that there is a wisdom behind it. In Islam, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Halal is clear and haram is clear. Just as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith that is found in Bukhari and Muslim, إِنَّ الْحَلَالَ بَيِّنٌ وَإِنَّ الْحَرَامَ بَيِّنٌ He said that indeed halal is clear and haram is clear. Yes, there are some matters that are doubtful in Islam. There are some doubtful matters and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this very hadith, he alluded to this. But even concerning doubtful matters, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam instructs us to avoid them in order to protect our deen and to protect our ard, our honor. Halal is what Allah has made permissible and haram is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made impermissible even if your nafs, even if yourself desires, desires it. And the most important halal that a Muslim must pursue and ensure that is void from anything haram is our wealth. Our wealth and income that nourishes our bodies. And the evidence for this is found in the hadith of Sunan At-Tirmidhi. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا تزول قدم عبد يوم القيامة حتى يسأل عن أربع That the two feet of a servant will not move on the day of resurrection until he has been questioned about four things. عن عمره فيما أفناه About his life and how he spent it. وعن جسده فيما أبلاه And about his body and how he used it. وعن ماله من أين أخذه وفيما أنفقه And about his wealth. Where did he earn it from and how did he spend it? وعن علمه ماذا عمل به And about his knowledge and what did he do about that knowledge? In this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said you will be questioned about four things. Of the four things, 
One of them, there are two questions pertaining to it. The rest, you only have one question. Of the four things, you will be asked about your wealth, two questions. Where did you earn it from and how did you spend it? Are you and I ready to answer these two questions about our wealth? So my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, a Muslim must ensure that he eats, he drinks, he clothes, him, he clothes himself and nourishes himself and his dependents from what is halal. In the hadith which is found in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet wasallam gives a very beautiful analogy or example. And he said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ طَيِّبٌ لَا يَقْبَلُ إِلَّا طَيِّبًا Allah Azza wa Jal is good and accepts only that which is good. وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ أَمَرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ بِمَا أَمَرَ بِهِ الْمُرْسَلِينَ And Allah has commanded the believers to do that which He commanded the messengers. فَقَالَ تَعَالَى And then He says, Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا الرُّسُلُ كُلُوا مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَعَمَلُوا صَالِحًا O oh messengers, eat of the good things and do right. وَقَالَ تَعَالَى He gives another example from the Qur'an and he says يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُلُوا مِنْ طَيِّبَاتِ مَا رَزَقْنَاكُمْ O oh you who believe, Eat of the good things we have provided you. Then he goes on to mention the case of one who is a traveler. He mentions the case of a man who's on a journey and his hair is out, it's disheveled and he is all dusty. He's a man in need and he's a traveler and we know that the dua of a traveler is indeed accepted by Allah Azza wa Jal. And this man, he raises his hands up to Allah to ask him for something. But his food is from haram. His drink is from haram. His clothing is from haram. He has nourished his body through haram. The Prophet wasallam then said, so how can he be answered? And we ask the same question today, 1400 years later, how can a person who is dealing with haram, whether it be through lying and deception, riba, and other haram engagements, how can a person raise his hand? And we all need Allah Azza wa Jal at one point or another in our life. We need Allah Azza wa Jal all the time. But there are going to be some times and some circumstances that we need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very much. And you raise your hands to Allah, yet you are surrounded with haram. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, how can your dua be accepted? How can a person who surrounds himself with all of this haram, think that Allah Azza wa Jal will answer his dua or his supplication. One of our pious predecessors, one of the Salaf al-Salih, they said some beautiful words. They said, مَنْ أَكَلَ الْحَرَامِ عَصَتْ جَوَارِحُهُ شَاءَ أَمْ أَبَا عَلِمَ أَمْ لَمْ يَعْلَمْ Wise words. Whoever consumes haram, his limbs disobey Allah. Whether he likes it or not, or whether he knows it or not, just by disobeying Allah Azza wa Jal. In the hadith found in Sunan al-Tirmidhi, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِنَّهُ لَا يَرْبُ لَحْمٌ نَبَتَ مِنْ سُحْتٍ إِلَّا كَانَتْ أَنَّارُ أَوْلَى بِهِ That the flesh gathered on one's body by means of impure earnings, deserves to be thrown into the fire of hell. And in the hadith found in Mustad al-Imam Ahmad, he alayhi salatu wassalam said, La yadkhulu al-jannata lahmun nabata min al-suhd. That the flesh nourished from impurities will not enter Jannah. Some of the women of the past, 
the pious women of the past, they used to give a, a reminder to their husbands when they were taking off in the morning to earn the livelihood. They would say, Ya Aba Fulan, Ittaqillaha Fina, Wala Tutimuna illa halal, Fainana Nasbiru ala alamil jua fid dunya, Wala Nasbiru ala nari yo malkiyama. O oh, father of such and such, or oh, O oh, such and such, fear Allah regarding us and do not feed us except from halal. Halal means, for verily we are able to bear the pains of this world, but we are not able to bear the punishment of the fire in the hereafter. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, one of the minor signs of the hour prophesied by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 1400 years ago is the widespread dealings of riba, of usury and interest. In the hadith found in At-Tabarani, hadith Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu wa arda, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, بَيْنَ يَدَيِ السَّاعَةَ يَظْهَرُ الرِّبَى وَالزِّنَى وَالْخَمْرِ That closer to the coming of the hour, the day of judgment, riba, Zina, that is fornication and adultery, and intoxication, whether it be through the intoxication of alcohol or drugs and the like, this will be widespread, this will be manifest. And listen to this hadith that is recorded in Abu Dawood, Sunan Abi Dawood, the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu wa arda. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Layatiyanna. على الناس زمان لا يبقى منهم أحد إلا أكل الربا فمن لم يأكله أصابه من غباره. He said there will come a time when when you will not be able to find a single person in the world who will not be consuming riba. And if anyone claims that he is not consuming riba, then surely the dust then surely the dust of riba will reach him. So even though you might not directly be involved in riba, there might be circumstances that are beyond your control that you must deal with riba. Or for example, you will find yourself in a situation where you don't even know that you've dealt with riba. Whilst you have. The meaning of riba, and by the way, riba is mentioned in some 12 verses in the Quran. And it is often translated in English as usury or interest. But inshallah, I will be using the word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used in the Quran and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used in the sunnah, riba. Literally, the word riba means to increase. It's a verb, to increase, to grow. That's what riba means, to exceed. When we look at now riba from an Islamic perspective, Technically, it is any loan which involves an increase in repayments. This is, generally speaking, riba. And in a few moments, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to give examples of the types of riba in Islam. Riba is one of the most destructive sins in Islam. And many Muslims, unfortunately, have become very complacent regarding riba and dealing with riba either it could be through their ignorance their lack of knowledge it could be because they underestimate the sin or it could be their lack of fear of allah azza wa jal their lack of taqwa of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is a major sin in islam and a major sin in islam is identifiable generally speaking through three signs if you want to know if a sin is a major sin or not, you look for one of three signs. The first sign is there's a serious warning about it. A serious warning in the Quran or Sunnah. Or there is a la'an. For example, we say la'an Allah. If you hear la'an Allah or la'an Rasulullah, such and such who does such and such, then that sin is a major sin. Or there is a had. There is a punishment for it in this life or a punishment in the hereafter. When it comes to riba, it meets all three, as we will see in a few moments. Now, 
Riba is one of the seven major or most evil of sins in Islam. Although many scholars today have numbered 70, that seems to be the most correct opinion that there are more than seven, but seven are included in the 70. As Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu wa arda said, they are closer to 70 than seven. Yet here the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the hadith which is found in Bukhari and Muslim, he said to the Sahaba that were around him, Ijtanibu sab'al mubiqat. He said, avoid the seven most evil of sins. Or avoid the seven most destructive sins. Qalu, ya Rasulallah, wa ma hun? A messenger of Allah, what are they? Qala, ash-shirku billah. That you associate a partner with Allah Azza wa Jal. Was-sihr, magic, or sorcery, or witchcraft. وَقَتْلُ النَّفْسِ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ And killing a soul whom Allah has forbidden killing unless it is done lawfully. وَأَكْلُ الرِّبَا And the consumption of riba. وَأَكْلُ مَا لِلْيَتِيمِ And the consuming of the property of a yatim, an orphan, the one who has lost his father under the age of puberty. وَالتَّوَلِّ يَوْمَ الزَّحَفِ And running away from the battlefield. وَقَذْفُ الْمُحْصَنَاتُ الْغَافِلَاتُ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ And slandering innocent, chaste, believing women. So in this hadith, the Prophet wasallam mentioned riba. And the very fact that he mentioned it alongside with what? With shirk. And shirk is the number one sin in Islam, which is not forgiven if you die in a state of shirk. If you repent from shirk before your death, you will be forgiven. But if you die in a state of shirk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive you. You will go to the hellfire. Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bih, wa yaghfiru ma duna dhalika liman yasha. Allah does not forgive that partners be associated with him and he forgives whatever is beyond that for whomever he wills. Riba is condemned and is prohibited, number one, in the Qur'an. Number two, in the Sunnah. Number three, in the sayings of the Sahaba. Number four, there is ijma', there is scholarly consensus. And number five, in the original versions, of the Abrahamic scriptures, both in Judaism and Christianity. It is forbidden. How much more do you want? You might be asking, what's the dalil? What's the proof? Well, let's look at prohibition of riba in the Quran. The main verses that deal with riba are in Surah Al-Baqarah. From verses 275 to 279. For example, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verses 278 and 279, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ya فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا فَأْذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ O oh, you who believe, be afraid or revere Allah. Have taqwa Allah and give up what remains due from riba if you are believers. And if you do not do it, then take a notice of war from Allah and His Messenger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 276, he tells us that wealth does not increase, but decreases in the long run through riba. Allah Azza wa Jal says, يَمْحَقُ اللَّهُ الرِّبَا وَيُرْبِ الصَّدَقَاتِ يَمْحَق Allah destroys riba. And he increases charities. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, مَا نَقَصَ مَالٍ مِنْ صَدَقَةٍ 
that the wealth that is given through sadaqah or by means of sadaqah never decreases. The opposite is true when it comes to riba. The barakah, the barakah of the wealth decreases and as the mufassirun, as the, one of the commentators of the Quran, he said, the barakah of the wealth decreases just as the light of a full moon decreases at the end of the month. It decreases bit by bit. Because no, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, your wealth, there is a barakah in it. If the barakah is removed, even if you have an excess amount of wealth, you will find it doesn't get you very far. You will be spending it on either your health or your illness or your car or your vehicle or your child. There is no barakah. What about prohibition of riba from the hadith? In the hadith found in Bukhari and Muslim, let me remind you that the Prophet ﷺ said, مَا نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْهُ فَاجْتَنِبُوهُ That whatever I have forbade you from doing, then keep away from it. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ That whatever, whatever he gives you, then take it. And whatever he prohibits you from doing, then leave it off. And during the farewell pilgrimage, the Prophet wasallam he gave khutbatul wada' the farewell sermon. Some penetrating advice which is applicable to every time and place until the Day of Judgment. In this farewell advice, the Prophet said, أَلَا إِنَّ كُلَّ رِبًا كَانَ فِي الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ مَوْضُوعٌ عَنْكُمْ كُلُّ لَكُمْ رُؤُوسُ أَمْوَالِكُمْ لَا تَظْلِمُونَ وَلَا تُظْلَمُونَ وَأَوَّلُ رِبًا مَوْضُوعٌ رِبَ الْعَبَّاسِ إِبْنْ عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبِ مَوْضُوعٌ كُلُّ He said verily every case of riba from the jahiliyyah is completely annulled. You will only take back your capital without increase or decrease. The first riba that I annul is the riba of Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. All of it is annulled. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, the ugliness of this major sin can be seen in the words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam found in Al-Hakim. In the collection of Al-Hakim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, الربا ثلاثة وسبعون بابا أيسرها مثل أن ينكح الرجل أمة. He said there are seventy three types of riba, the least of which is as abhorrent as a man having intercourse with his own mother. والعياذ بالله. The least of riba is like sleeping with your mother. And riba is more dangerous than zina, than fornication and adultery. And the proof is found in Musnad al-Imam Ahmad, whereby the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Dirhamu riba ya'kuluhu rajulu wa huwa ya'lam ashaddu inda Allahi min sittatin wa thalathina zanya. That a dirham, this was the currency back then, dinars and dirham, it's like saying a dollar. A dirham of riba, which a person consumes knowingly, is worse than committing zina 36 times. And in the hadith found in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, informs us that any party, any individual who is involved in a riba transaction is cursed. Anyone who has anything remotely to do with that transaction is cursed. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَعَنَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ آكِلَ الرِّبَا وَمُوكِلَهُ وَشَاهِدَيْهِ وَكَاتِبَيْهِ وَقَالَهُمْ سَوَاءٌ 
the Messenger of Allah, cursed the one who accepted the riba, the one who paid it. Many people might say, but I don't accept it, I'm only paying. Well, this hadith is now proof and evidence that if you pay riba, you are cursed. The one who accepts riba, the one who paid it, the one who recorded it, and the two witnesses to it, he said, they are all alike. They are all alike. So based on this, it is not permitted, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, to do work that involves writing a riba-based contract. All the conditions or paying or receiving or depositing or guarding it. So generally speaking, it is haram to be either directly or indirectly involved in any which way, shape or form in riba based on this hadith which is found in Sahih Muslim. And what does it mean, the curse of Allah Azza wa Jal? The curse of Allah Azza wa Jal means that you have distanced yourself from the rahmah of Allah Azza wa Jal. Who here can say that they are not in need of the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal, of the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Wallahi, we need the rahmah of Allah with every breath that we take. One of the brothers that I came across in my life taught me a very beautiful lesson. He said to me, brother, I wanted to have a child. For seven years I tried to have a child. And I couldn't have a child. Allah Azza wa Jal did not give me a child. He said, I worked for a bank. During this period, I worked for a bank. And I was in charge of doing the contracts for riba. And then I turned, I turned to Allah Azza wa Jal and I repented. I left my job. My job was earning me a lot of money. He said, I found another job. Actually, I began working for myself and he started a small business. And he said that he was only earning a third of what he was earning from the bank. He said, you know what, my brother? He said, I feel more happier now. I'm more content. And I find there is barakah in my wealth. There is barakah in my wealth more than the money that I was getting from the bank. He said, and on top of all of this, seven years later, my wife just gave birth. Sometimes we think that a matter, a sin, it's insignificant. But to Allah Azza wa Jal, it is great. So there's no blessing in your wealth, in your health, in your time. Because all of these successes come from Allah Azza wa Jal. So the least harm that riba does to you is that it takes away from the barakah. And the proof to this is in the collection of al-hakim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, al-riba wa in kathur fa inna aqibatuhu ila qil. He said that even if riba is much, it will end up being a small amount. There's no barakah in it. So now we've given the evidence from the Qur'an, evidence from the Sunnah. What about the Sahaba? Imam al-Dhahabi has a book called The Major Sins. In this book, he lists 70 major sins. And when he spoke about riba, he mentions some of the aqwal, some of the sayings of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum wa He gives, for example, what Abdul Rahman ibn Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu, said, he reported his father as saying, إِذَا ظَهَرَ الزِّنَا وَالْرِبَا فِي قَرْيَةً أَذِنَ اللَّهُ بِهَلَاكِهَا That when zina, adultery and fornication, and riba appear in a city, in a place, in a town, Allah orders its destruction. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu wa ardah as-siddiq, he said, الزائد he said, the one who increases and the one who requests for an increase is in the fire. Again, this is another proof that both the 
recipient and the giver of riba are doomed and subjecting themselves to the hellfire. I said earlier that riba is haram. It is haram for the Jews and the Christians as mentioned in their scriptures. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made unlawful for the Jews certain good foods which had been made halal to them. He made it haram. Why? Listen to this. In Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4 of the Quran, verse 161, Allah Azza wa Jal says, فَبِظُلْمٍ مِّنَ الَّذِينَ هَادُوا حَرَّمْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ حَرَّمْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ طَيِّبَاتٍ أُحِلَّتْ لَهُمْ وَبِصَدِّهِمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ كَثِيرًا وَأَخْذِهِمُ الرِّبَا وَقَدْ نُهُوا عَنْهِ وَأَخْذِهِمُ الرِّبَا وَقَدْ نُهُوا عَنْهِ For wrongdoing on the part of the Jews, we made unlawful for them certain good foods which had been lawful to them. And for their averting from the way of Allah many people and for their taking usury, riba, while they had been forbidden from it. So when we look for example at the Torah, at the Torah, the Torah for example expresses regulations against the charging of interest. So for example when we look in Exodus chapter 22 verse 25, it is said, if you lend money to my people, to the poor person among you, you must not be like a money lender to him. You must not charge him interest. It is prohibited in Christianity. So much so that I even came across a text that said that in Christianity, it is believed that the one who consumes usury should not be shrouded if he dies. And in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 36, it says, Take no usury or interest from him, but fear your God. So the Abrahamic faiths have forbidden riba in a matter, whether it's Islam, Christianity, or Judaism. The Abrahamic faiths have forbidden riba in a manner that leaves no room for doubt concerning its prohibition. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade the consumption of non-halal food, the meat of the khinzir, the meat of swine, of pig. Alcohol is haram, is forbidden. And you find that the majority of Muslims, they don't eat. They only eat in halal, very, very careful and cautious only to eat from halal sources. And not to eat or drink from these forbidden things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He forbade a person from marrying his mother, his sister, his auntie, and other close relatives. And you will almost never come across cases where Muslims have transgressed these injunctions. So why is it then, why is it that many Muslims feel it is less problematic to engage with riba, to treat the issue lightly, when it is just as significant, in fact, it is more significant than many other of the major sins in Islam. You don't find Muslims, for example, looking for concessions to make those things that we mentioned previously lawful. So this is something that we need to have an understanding of. Let's move on inshallah ta'ala now to the types of riba. The types of riba that existed at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They are of two types. The first one is known as riba an nasia Riba an nasia Which is a riba on loans. A riba on loans or on debts. And this was very widespread during the time of the Prophet ﷺ and during the Jahiliyyah time. And it was practiced in a number of ways. The first way is that the lender would lend money to a borrower for a fixed period of time. He gives him money. He says, here you go. You can borrow this money for a fixed period of time. 
when the time had expired and the borrower was unable to repay back the debt by the due date the lender would give him extra time he'll say okay i'm going to give you extra time but i'm going to charge you an addition that's riba and that is similar to what we have today in interest free loans in interest free loans you are allowed say 12 months or 24 months to take a product to purchase it and not pay anything or pay it off before 24 months and it's interest free but beyond that you start to pay the interest this is haram to engage in this contract in the first place is haram because you are agreeing to riba conditions you are agreeing to pay riba even though your intention is not to you have signed a contract that I will pay that riba afterwards the second type or manner of riba and nasia it takes place when the lender would lend a borrower money for a fixed period of time at a determined rate at a determined rate of interest to be paid monthly so what happens he lends him the amount and he says okay you pay me this amount at this date but from now to this date you must pay these additional installments and then on the due date you give back the principal you give back the money that you borrowed so see how they're doing it in different ways this is still riba a third way was that the lender would lend a borrower money for a fixed period of time at a determined rate of interest to be paid together with the principal on the expiration of the time so on the due date so then they'll say okay I want to borrow $100 from you. He says, here you go. Here's $100. Pay me $200 on this date. So he's charged the interest altogether. You pay it altogether on the due date. All of this is haram and is riba. There is a basic principle here, brothers and sisters in Islam. Know this principle. To stay away from riba. As Ibn Qudama said, every loan in which it is stipulated that more be paid back is haram with no difference of scholarly opinion so if there is any loan any financial loan that you take and there is a stipulation that you need to pay back more that's it that's riba if there's a benefit to the creditor to the lender then that's definitely riba likewise today we have people buying homes through mortgages through the banks so when they go to the bank and they say, can you please buy this home for me? And they buy the home and they sell it to you and you pay back, you know, your repayments. That is riba. So this is what we're talking about here. Let's move on, inshallah ta'ala, to the second type of riba, which is known as riba al-fadl. So we said there's two types of riba. The second one is riba al-fadl. And this is where you are exchanging like goods or certain or specific like goods in different quantities there's a hadith found in sahih muslim whereby the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said al-dhahabu bil-dhahab wal-fiddatu bil-fidda wal-burru bil-burr wal-sha'iru bil-sha'ir wal-tamru bil-tamr wal-milhu bil-milh mithlan bi-mithl sawa'an bi-sawa' yadan bi-yad fa-idha akhtalafat hathihi al-asnaf fa-bi'u kayfa shi'tum idha kana yadan bi-yad he said sell gold in exchange of equivalent gold sell silver in exchange of equivalent silver sell wheat in exchange of equivalent wheat sell barley in exchange of equivalent barley sell dates in exchange of equivalent dates sell salt in exchange of equivalent salt but if it is an exchange of different commodities then sell how you wish on the condition it is hand to hand in other words, as long as it's done on the spot. I'll give you an example from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is found in Sahih Bukhari. Once Bilal, Bilal brought a kind of dates known as Barni. He brought it to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he asked him, from where are these dates, Ya Bilal? And he said, I had some inferior types, type of dates. I had a less 
quality type of date and I exchanged it for two sars of it for one sar of Barni dates. So it's sar is a measure. I gave two of my type for one of the, the superior type of date. So it's given extra. And so here it is for you, Ya Rasulullah, so you can eat it. The Prophet wasallam said, beware, beware, this is definitely riba. This is definitely riba. Don't do so. But if you want to buy a superior kind of dates, sell the inferior dates for money. Sell the inferior first, collect the money, have it in your hand, and then go and buy the superior type with that money. So let's now deduce from this some examples. Let's give some examples that are similar or that the ulama have spoken that are similar to this situation or this scenario. For example, trading 100 grams of old gold or silver for 90 grams of new gold or silver. If you do an exchange of old gold for new, where there is not the same commodity, not the same amount, this is riba. Has to be for the same amount. Or sell, buy. For example, we have money exchange today. So you cannot buy, for example, 100 American dollars with 90 Australian dollars unless the t transaction takes place on the spot. There cannot be a delay. There cannot be, for example, an IOU. I owe you. No. When you do a currency exchange, it must happen right there and then because the rate is always changing. Tomorrow it's different to today. Islam is about looking after everybody. Otherwise, if you have an IOU, then you've engaged in riba. I'll give you another example. You cannot purchase gold or silver by installments. So putting it aside and then paying it off. That's not allowed. You must pay the total amount in one transaction. So you save up the amount and you buy it. Otherwise, the ulama have said that you have engaged in riba. Also, when you are trading in, when you are trading in old gold for new gold, you must receive the trade the trading price entirely before purchasing the new gold. The scenario is, you go to trading gold, you've got some old gold, and you want some new gold. They'll say to you, okay, what's, you say, what's the value of this old gold? They say, your gold is $100. This new gold here is $200. You cannot say, here you go, here's the old gold, and here's $100. What you must do is you say, here's the old gold, you valued it at $100, give me $100. Take the $100, pull out your $100 and give the $200 to them. If you don't do it that way, you have engaged in a riba. You see how simple it is? It's a fine line between halal and haram. A fine line, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam. So let's move on now, inshallah ta'ala. Why does Islam prohibit riba? Why does Islam prohibit riba? Well, first of all, we say because it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's infinite wisdom, as we said earlier, that he prohibits riba. And it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wisdom that he commands something to be allowed or not allowed. And so when we start to ponder over the text regarding riba in both the Quran and Sunnah, the Muslim scholars have given several reasons and suggestions as to why Allah may have enforced such laws upon the people. And I want to give a few of the reasons that the ulama gave. Number one, they said that riba is a sure gain without any possibility of loss. Hence, all the risk is taken by the borrower rather than sharing the risk and the profits. Number two, riba retards economic growth and development just as we are feeling now through the global financial crisis gfc as they call it number three riba is one of the major contributors of inflation 
Number four, riba negates the culture of brotherhood and sympathy towards one another. And number five, from a moral and spiritual point, riba is clearly based on greed, selfishness, narrow-mindedness and hard-heartedness. And it nurtures the same evils in the moneylender. These are only some of the reasons that the ulama have given. As for the punishment, the punishment of riba, the ramifications for engaging in riba begins in this life, upon resurrection, in the grave, which is in the Hayatul Barzakh, and in the hereafter. As for this life, one of the ramifications of riba, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as I read out earlier, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 276, يَمْحَقُ اللَّهُ الرِّبَا وَيُرْبِ الصَّدَقَاتِ That Allah destroys riba and He increases for you charities. In the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٍ that whatever of misfortune befalls you is due to what your own hands have earned. And yet he pardons much. So when you're dealing with riba, you are dealing with haram. And he's saying that whatever of misfortune befalls you, it is due to what your own hands have earned. In the hayat of al-barzakh, and al-barzakh means the life between this life and the next life and the hereafter. And beyond Judgment Day, there is a life. Or Judgment Day, there is a life known as Al-Barzakh. And in the hadith found in Bukhari, hadith Samura ibn Jundub, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam narrates to the Sahaba a dream that he has. A dream where he said, last night two men came to me. This is in the dream. And they said, come with us. I went with them to a place. He went with them. And the Prophet wasallam, he mentions eight, eight scenarios that he saw. And at the fourth scenario, he said, we proceeded until we reached a river of blood with a man swimming in the center. On the bank of the river, there was a man who had piled around him many rocks. The man in the river would swim for a while and then approach the one who had gathered the rocks around him trying to exit. He's trying to exit from the river. He would open his mouth and he, that is the one on the bank, would throw a rock into it. Causing him to return to his original position in the middle of the river. He would then resume swimming and every time he made an effort to get out of the river, he would throw a rock into his mouth, forcing him to fall back to the center. I said, who are these two? And the angels, they said, come along, come along. They kept on telling him. Every time he saw a scene, they would tell him, come along, come along. They wouldn't inform him. And after the eighth scenario, he said, since the beginning of the night, you have taken me to different places. And I have been seeing amazing things. What is all of this that I saw? They said, we will now tell you. As for the man whom you saw swimming in the river and being fed with rocks, he is the one who devours riba. And in Musnad al-Imam Ahmad, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he mentions that during the, the incident of al-Mi'raj, Al-Isra'u wal-Mi'raj The journey of Al-Isra, the night journey During the ascension leg of the journey The Prophet Sallallahu Passed by a group of people Whose stomachs were like that of houses In these houses were snakes That could be seen from the outside So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Asked Jibreel, who was his companion Gabriel. He asked about them and he was informed they are the ones who deal with riba. And just as the saying goes, Al Jaza'u min jinsil amal. 
that the punishment is in accordance with the action. Just as they filled up their stomachs with haram, nourishing themselves with haram, engaging in the haram, they are punished in this very manner. Upon resurrection, those that engage in riba will be resurrected as if they have been beaten by shaitan into insanity as a humiliation for them. Whenever they try to stand up, they fall back down. Allah Azza wa Jal says in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 275, <laughs> إِلَّا كَمَا يَقُومُ الَّذِي يَتَخَبَّطُوا الشَّيْطَانُ مِنَ الْمَسِّ ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَالُوا إِنَّمَا الْبَيْعُ مِثْلُ الرِّبَا وَأَحَلَّ اللَّهُ الْبَيْعَ وَحَرَّمَ الرِّبَا Those who devour riba will not stand. In other words, on the day of judgment, except like the standing of a person beaten by shaitan, leading to madness. That is because they say, trade is like riba. They gave excuses. They said, what's the big deal? Riba, trade, it's the same. Just like trade, the price goes up and down. Well, riba can go up and down. But it's not the same. It is definitely not the same. Because with trade, there is... Prices go up and down based on demand and supply, supply and demand. Whereas riba, it's only because of the timing that they inflate the price. But Allah has permitted trade, tijara, and forbidden riba. So, this is the punishment so far we've seen. Punishment in life, punishment in al-barzakh, punishment when you are being resurrected. As for the punishment in the hereafter, other than the promised hellfire, if Allah Azza wa Jal wills to punish a person in the hellfire, before this, Allah will wage war against him. Allah will wage a war. There are only two punishments in Islam that warrant a war from Allah Azza wa Jal. Only one of them is mentioned in the Quran and the other is mentioned in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in the Quran, as I said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not declare war on any people except the people of riba. Allah will not wage war against those who drank alcohol or took drugs or gambled or fornicated or any other sin. And we all know how grave and serious those sins are. But Allah Azza wa Jal will wage war against those who deal with riba. Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2 of the Quran, verse 279. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqu Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqu Allah wa dharu ma baqiya min al-riba in kuntum mu'mineen. فَإِن لَّمْ تَفْعَلُوا فَأَذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ O you who have believed. And as one of the Sahaba, he said, whenever you hear Allah Azza wa Jal says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا O you who have believed. Allah Azza wa Jal is talking to me, he's talking to you. He's not talking to somebody out of this earth or a third party. They said, listen very carefully. For what is about to come, is either a command to do good or a command to leave off something which is bad. So, he said, observe your duty to Allah and give up what remains from riba if you are true believers. And if you do not, then be warned of a war from Allah and his messenger. So when he comes out of his grave, this miskin, he will be given weapons by the angels and he will be told to go and fight against Allah Azza wa Jal. 
My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, I want to move on inshallah ta'ala and talk about some of the excuses that people give for dealing with riba. And I would like to debunk and refute some of these feeble excuses because they are deceiving nobody but themselves. One of the excuses that people give for taking a riba loan, a mortgage, through a bank that deals in a non-Islamic way, through riba, they say, look, you know, I am in need. And I know that there is an Islamic principle whereby the ulama have derived a principle that states, الضرورات تبيح المحظورات that extreme necessity makes permissible the unlawful. We say you have spoken the truth. That yes, there is a principle that says If there is an extreme necessity and you are in dire need, you are allowed to commit haram. Correct. And what a marvelous and a beautiful principle that is. But many people have misused this principle. In light of this principle, some scholars have given a fatwa, an Islamic ruling that a Muslim may engage in a riba-based transaction when they enter a state of darurah or hajah, extreme necessity or need. Let me say from my research and analysis, and Allah Azza wa Jal is my witness, that this fatwa does not apply to the masses of Muslims living in Western countries, especially Australia and New Zealand, as there is no haja or darura. Because the issue of darura or haja has conditions, has constraints. Some of the constraints and conditions under which the rule of necessity is applicable includes, number one, that the necessity is actually existing and not something which is expected or anticipated. So you can't say, I think I might end up in this situation or that situation. The condition must exist. It's existing right now to you. It's happening to you. Also, number two, when someone is faced by necessity and all its conditions and constraints are observed, then the unlawful becomes lawful to him. Thirdly, that there is no other alternative. This is the one that's very important here. That there is no other alternative in facing the state of necessity other than committing the unlawful act. Many Muslims are acquiring home loans and they cite the example of necessity. And as I said earlier, the concept of haja or darura does not or is not applicable in Australia and New Zealand when it comes to the issue of housing. Why? Because number one, this is a country and other countries as well, the Western countries, if you cannot afford to buy a home, if Allah doesn't bless you with the income and has not decreed for you to buy a home, then there is a wealth of rental property ranging from mansions you want to rent a mansion rent a mansion if you can afford it down to the simplest of flats or unit or villas or townhouses call them what you like it's up to you in your budget and if your income number two if your income doesn't allow you to cover the cost of rent then the government has a system in place when you can apply for and receive an accommodation supplement, which we know it as what? Rent assistance. To help you meet the cost. And number three, if your financial situation is even more difficult, the government also has a state housing system. You know, housing commission, I think we call it. By which they will provide you with a house at a cost you can afford. So in other words... Australia and New Zealand are two of the few countries on earth where no family needs to end up homeless for no good reason. There are systems in place and which are remarkably Islamic. They are Islamic. 
So if these systems are in place, there goes the darura out the window. No more darura exists. No more hajjah exists to buy a home. And if the Australian or New Zealand system or any system in the world changes or it is in existence, demands that the only way of finding accommodation was to sign a mortgage contract, then there would be grounds for arguing darura when it becomes obligatory. But no such system exists, at least for these two countries. Another common argument that we hear our Muslim brothers and sisters saying that rent is a waste of money. Or what do they say? They say it is dead money. And you have nothing to show for it at the end. It sounds reasonable at face value. But waste, according to who is it waste? Since when my beloved brothers and sisters in Islam is spending money in a halal fashion wasteful? Rent is halal, it's permissible. How could we say it is wasteful? Or that it's inappropriate? Islam teaches us that any halal action that is chosen over a haram is counted as a sadaqah, as a charity. Especially when you're choosing it over a haram. And we learn this from the hadith when the Prophet ﷺ, he said to the Sahaba, when you have conjugal relations, when you have intimacy with your spouse, it is sadaqah. They said, Ya Rasulullah, there's one of us fulfill his shahwa, fulfill his desire, and he is rewarded for this? He said, if he did it in haram, would he not have attained a wizard, a sin? Would he not have been sinful? He said, likewise, when you do something that is halal over the haram, you are rewarded for it. So when you are paying rent and you know it's haram to take a mortgage out and you're doing it for the sake of Allah, then you are being rewarded for it. Why is it a waste? Look at it as rewards from Allah Azza wa Jal. Look at it as a form of sadaqah that you are giving. And they say that you don't have anything to show for it. Maybe Allah Azza wa Jal is blessing your wealth and your health and your family and giving you things you may not have been receiving if you were dealing with haram like my friend, like our brother for seven years was not able to have that ultimate happiness and have a child and be happy. But when he left off riba and dealing with it, Allah Azza wa Jal amazed him with his bounty. Or maybe Allah Azza wa Jal is preparing a home for you or a mansion for you in Jannah for the small price and sacrifice that you are making. No one's asking you to leave your city. Yani the Sahaba, they had to leave their whole city. Just move on to another home and a change is as good as a holiday. Why can't you be positive about it? It's up to you, it's in the mind. If you think about it positively, you will see the merit in it and you'll be happy. And you will accept Allah Azza wa Jal's decree. By the way, even when you are engaged in a mortgage, you do not own that home until you have paid the last dollar. It's not yours anyway. And then you have excuses, for example, Who's going to look after my children? I'm doing this as an investment for my children in the future. No, my dear brother and sister in Islam, it is not you and I who look after our children. It is Allah Azza wa Jal who looks after them. Wallahu khayrun hafidha. That's what Allah Azza wa Jal says. He is the best of protectors. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is providing for them. What about if you die tomorrow and you have a mortgage? Who's going to pay the mortgage for your children? That's it. They, out that goes. What, you then pass on the sin to somebody else? So, really, is it that big of a deal to own a home in this life? You see, that's the thing. We've been programmed by shaitan and his agents that owning your own home is the dream. Wallahi, I know brothers and I know sisters. They don't own a home, they rent. But wallahi, they are the happiest of people. They go to Umrah almost every year. They go on a holiday. They have a nice car. They have good health, good children. Their children are at the best of schools. They don't own a home. You want to own a home? Work towards a home in Jannah. 
pray 12 rak'at in the day and night. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that whoever prays 12 units in the day and night, two before Fajr, four before Dhuhr, two after Dhuhr, two after Maghrib, two after Isha, Allah will build for him because of them a mansion in Jannah. Contribute towards a masjid. Build a masjid. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that whoever contributes towards the building of a masjid, Allah Azza wa Jal will build for him or her a mansion in Jannah. That's what counts. A house in this world, your house will perish sooner or later. Either you will perish first or it will perish before you. It's going to happen sooner or later. Let's do some maths. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said what? The average life of my ummah is between 60 and 70. And a few people will surpass this age. So you get married and many a times people acquire a mortgage at the age of 30. And then usually the mortgage is for 30 years. You are now 60 years old. And then you pay it off. And death is around the corner. Not only has your body wrinkled, but you have wrinkled your iman and your faith. And your Islam is all wrinkled. And you're going to meet Allah Azza wa Jal. Wallahi, I would prefer to meet Allah Azza wa Jal without wrinkles in my Islam. I want it to be like a nice clean sheet. Another issue that we can add to this, the stress of mortgage is so much so that we find today women have to also work the wife has to work to maintain the repayments of the mortgage what does that do that causes undue stress on the family unit on the family home so the husband comes home he's tired the wife comes home she's tired so the husband eats lazy or tired meals there are tired conversations there is tired intimacy all of that, why? The children are neglected. Children are neglected. They are a tam. They are orphans, but their parents are alive because they don't get to see their parents because all the parents are worried about is the dream. What's the dream? The home. I need to own my home. We need to change this way of thinking, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam. Your home is anywhere that you live and there is shelter, that's sutra. I know many Arabs, they say, you know, it's sutra. They say, you know, but, but, but nastatir, you know, they say they, you know, use these words. That's again the shaitan deceiving them. What? Can I live for 15, 20, 50 or 60 years in rent and be absolutely okay? Of course you can. Wallahu ja'ala lakum min buyutikum sakana. You need to find this sakina and tranquility in your home. You will not find it when your home is built upon haram, when it's built upon haram foundations. You're not going to find it. That's why begin your marital life. Begin with halal. Begin with pleasing Allah Azza wa Jal. Start the chapter clean. Start strong, inshaAllah ta'ala. Is there an alternative? Is there an alternative to purchasing a house on riba? Yes, there is. Today, banks throughout the world are currently embracing the central concepts of Islamic finance, even if they don't acknowledge them by this name. Furthermore, many banks are being proactive in creating and promoting Sharia compliant finance options. It's happening in this very country. It's happening in England. Big banks are taking on because they see the potential. They see that us Muslims make up a large segment of the world, of the financial world who are interested in these loans. So yes, more and more financial or halal friendly products are coming out. During the GFC, the global financial crisis, while the Western world's financial system is imploding, 
Islamic finance is weathering the storm. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. The Islamic finance industry has been resilient and has been expanding faster than any other subset of world banking at 15 to 20 percent a year in a report that I read. And there are global banks that have opened Sharia compliant branches. And I believe that it is only a matter of time before such products arrive in this country, in Australia and New Zealand. Insha'Allah. In the meantime, we need to be patient. And in the meantime, also, as these Islamic banks, institutes, cooperatives happen, do not be hasty. Because some of these banks, they offer many products. But not all of these products are necessarily endorsed by our scholars. So when you do go to an Islamic bank, and I don't want anyone to mention here the name of any Islamic bank, but when we go to an Islamic bank and they offer us an option, take that contract and go to a learned scholar who understands transaction law in Islam, mu'amalat, and monetary transactions, and ask him, Ya Shaykh, is this product halal even though it's in an Islamic bank? Because some Islamic banks, although they are doing their best, some of their products are not endorsed, not a consensus or an ijma or a jumhur that are endorsing that product. So this is a word of warning. And so my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, as I come to the end of this presentation, I remind you, it is the duty of Muslims everywhere to strive to find lawful alternatives to alleviate the state of darura and hajjah and save themselves from the need to adopt haram and unlawful ways. The Prophet wasallam, as I said earlier, prophesied that a time would come when the practice of riba would become so widespread that you will not be able to escape its vapor or its dust. Each and every aspect of this hadith has come into a reality. And that in itself is a miracle. This prophecy is a miracle. However, in no part of this hadith did the Prophet wasallam say, therefore, when this happens, no problem. When this happens, take part of it. No, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, this world is a test. It's a trial. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the second verse of Surah Al-Ankabut, chapter 29 of the Quran, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَن يُتْرَكُوا أَن يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ Do people think that they will be left alone because they say, Amanna, we believe, and that they will not be tested? And in Surah Al-Mulk, Surah Tabarak, Allah Azza wa Jal says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا The one who created death and life to test you. Who of you is best in actions? Remember in Islam there is something that you and I believe in in the sixth pillar of Iman. القضاء والقدر Accept the qadr that Allah has given you. Maybe if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you that wealth and you own your home, you would have deviated from the path of Allah azza wa jal. Because some people, if they have the money, they will deviate. Maybe it's better for you to be poor. Maybe it's better for you to be living a standard life so that you can worship Allah azza wa jal better. Think about Allah Azza wa Jal is the all wise and whatever he has decreed for you, you say Alhamdulillahi ala kulli hal. As for those who are dealing with riba, who have a mortgage, I say to you, fear Allah Azza wa Jal. And I remind you of the ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah verse 279, whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives you the solution. And he says, وَإِن تُبْتُمْ فَلَكُمْ رُؤُوسُ أَمْوَالِكُمْ لَا تَظْلِمُونَ وَلَا تُظْلَمُونَ 
But if you repent, there's a condition. If you repent, you may have your principle. Do not wrong and you are not wronged. Do not wrong by charging interest. And do not be wronged and make sure that you receive or you give back what is due to that person. As we know the conditions of the repentance, if you are dealing with riba, stop. Sell your home. Pay back what is owed to the bank. And take what is yours. If you have already paid off your home, repent to Allah by being remorseful and regretful and by intending not to do this sin again. And repent before it's too late. Before you die, these are the conditions of tawbah, of repentance. And if you do this, there is no blame on you. Even if you've paid off your home through riba, don't destroy your home. Don't burn your home. Don't sell your home. Unless you want to sell it to buy another home. You don't have to do this. But if you are now involved still in the riba and you're paying back, you have an obligation. You have an obligation to sell it and to put your trust in Allah Azza wa Jal. And subhanallah, after Allah Azza wa Jal, He mentioned those ayat about riba in Surah Al-Baqarah. So many verses. And He spoke about taqwa. And He spoke about being forgiving. After this, in the next ayah, He mentions, وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا تُرْجَعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا تُرْجَعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ He says, and fear, and fear a day, you will be made to return to Allah. Remember, you and I are going to be standing in front of Allah, Azza wa Jal, a day that is 50,000 years long. What have you prepared? What have I, what have you prepared for this day? Of standing before Allah Azza wa Jal. Know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He promises prosperity in this world and the next to those who abstain from riba, specifically those who abstain from riba. You want to be successful? You want to prosper? Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah Ali Imran, in the 130th verse of the third chapter of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu la ta'kulu riba la ta'kulu riba adhaafan mudha'afa wattaqu allaha la'allakum tuflihun wattaqu allaha la'allakum tuflihun O you who believe do not devour riba doubled and multiplied but fear Allah that you may prosper and remember the one who transgressed the limits that are set by Allah Azza wa Jal is wronging himself and lastly remember that neither happiness or grief is everlasting in this life but one of the two is everlasting in the next which one do you want my dear brother and sister in Islam and it's with these words that I leave you with, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan warzukna attiba'ah wa arina al-baatila baatilan warzukna ishtinabah wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala sayyidina Muhammad. لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله لا يزنو كعبا